all of these numbers represent young people, right? Like I, I talk about data points, I talk about disproportionality, but all of these represent young people. And so it, it has always been a problem. Anytime somebody is sleeping outside when they don't want to be, that is a problem. Whether there is one person or 5,000 young people, it has been a problem for a very long time. Welcome, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm Tori Bedford, I'm a reporter at GBH News. I uh, have written a lot about homelessness, and I actually uh, started writing about youth homelessness um, back when I was writing for Spare Change News and Dig Boston um, just a little over a decade ago. And the environment and um, the climate looked very different then. And I think we're going to learn about changes that have been made and understandings of the population. Um, but I wanted to introduce Elizabeth Jackson, who is the president and CEO of Bridge Over Troubled Waters, and Dr. Alice uh, Colgrove, who's the director of Homeless Youth Services at the Massachusetts Executive Office of Health and Human Services. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you for having us. So I want to just start with, I want both of you to answer this, but I'll start with you, Elizabeth. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what makes this population? I mean, we're talking when we talk about youth homelessness, who are we talking about and what makes this population unique? What are the unique challenges that they're facing? Uh, thank you. So I think um, just well, let's go back and talk about the picture we just saw. Right. We saw a tent city. And so when we think about homelessness, we think about a tent city or adults um people carrying their bag, trash bags, or pushing a cart, right? And, or somebody panhandling out in the streets. And when you've homelessness, they're really hitting in plain sight. They don't look like that. They're, they were probably your barista this morning, made you coffee, or they sat in a commuter bus with you uh, coming to work, or they uh, parked your car. Uh, they're in colleges, dorms, they're in high school, um, uh, feels there all over. And I think that is the main concern of how, what we think of homelessness and what we what we see youth homelessness is. And so first of all, we have to think about that they look very different and they're really hitting in plain sight with us. And I think part of the um, survival in terms of experiencing homelessness as a young person um, is about maintaining that anonymity and maintaining kind of as you mentioned, you know, staying, staying hidden. It's not something that is as easy to track. Um, yeah. It's embarrassing so I, for some. Yeah. I mean, it, well, people don't want to be profiled because there's such a strong stigma, right? That's right. Yeah. And so I, I want to ask you, Alice, I mean, across the state, you know, we're talking, looking a lot at Boston. And when I had started reporting on this 10 years ago, one of the biggest issues that uh, people were facing in terms of finding money for resources is just that they could not figure out the actual numbers of how many kids were out. You know, uh, I think it's like 17 to 24 is youth, right? Is that considered? In Massachusetts, we define an unaccompanied young adult as anyone under the age of 25, so 24 mm -hmm. and under. Oh, so a young yeah. adult would be 18 to 25, and then a minor mm -hmm. would be uh, 17 and below. Okay. But I, I guess my question is, what is the, the scope across the state? And how have you kind of figured out, I mean, do you, out of even the data that you have, like, do you trust it? Because obviously, there are so many people who are just invisible to that system. No, it's a great it's a great question. Um, so what we say is we say that there's there's two ways to look at how many young people are experiencing homelessness in a point in time on a, on a, on a given night and then over the course of the year. And so we say that in Massachusetts, we believe that there is at least a thousand youth and young adults experiencing homelessness on a given night. If we were to walk out and do a survey across the state right now, uh, we know that there's at least a thousand young people Though we know, as Elizabeth said, that a lot of them are hidden. Um, but a thousand young people have presented for services um, in different data counts. And so we think on a given night, there's a thousand young people. Over the course of the year, that number grows to over 3,000 youth and young adults across the state. That number comes from we kind of triangulate our data. We get data from a few different places, but there were 3,000 young adults who presented for services across the state um, last year in 2023. So again, those are who sought help. So we know that that's an undercount because there's a lot of young people who, because of the resilience of young people, 
are trying to make it and not asking for help, don't know where to go, haven't gotten help yet. And we want to encourage them to ask for help. But right now, about 3,000 have reached out and asked for help across the state. What does it take for someone to feel comfortable to ask for help? I mean, how, how have you kind of worked with, I imagine you've had to learn a lot in even just the last decade, right, about what it would take and, and how you could get to the point where you can figure out how to build that trust, right? I mean, what does that process look like in terms of, because those numbers are so important, right? Having that data in order to figure out how to resource this population, how do you do that? And how has that changed? I think the first one thing that we know, again, we, we really want people to reach out for help. We want to encourage folks to reach out for help because there is help available. Um, and But we know, we know that First, people need to be aware that there even is help available. They need to be aware of programs like Bridge over Troubled Waters or of Luck in Worcester or Dial Self out in Western Mass. They need to know that there are services available. So we need to make them more aware. Then once they're aware, this help has to actually be available. Someone needs to answer the phone. Uh, it needs to be accessible. We need to think about transportation options and then appropriate. We believe that there needs to be services designed specifically for young adults that are different than adults because of developmental needs and vulnerabilities. So we want to encourage this help seeking, but the help that we want them to encounter needs to be, again, available, appropriate, and accessible. Yeah, what, I, Elizabeth, maybe you can start with this as well, but, you know, in your day-to-day -day work, and I'm sure this has changed over time, but what are the unique challenges, right, that people face? How, how is this population different than the a population of adults experiencing homelessness or people adults experiencing chronic homelessness um thank you so people also need to understand that youth homelessness is very traumatic right we at bridge between 70 percent or 80 percent of the young people we see each year um, we assess them for trauma um, and experience of ptsd right and more than 50 percent are assessed with moderate and severe depression at intake so our young population really is dealing with, I always call it adult problems, adult concerns and issues that are hard to manage and systems that are hard for them um, to get through. At 18, you're considered an adult, right? And so what we believe at Bridge is that, yes, at 18, you're considered an adult, but you need support. You need develop, you need programs that are developmentally appropriate for you. We also know that at Bridge, 49% of the youth have been physic uh, physically in a fight. 71% um, experienced child abuse, 39% have been robbed, 67% uh, has been um, threatened, and 49% witnessed domestic violence, right? So the young people that are coming out to our doors are, are really dealing with a lot of pressures, and now they have to figure out where to get to something to eat, where to sleep at night, where to get the medication, and that's a lot of stress. And so, and not to mention the young people that are just, they're completely hiding. They're going to school. They're still waking up in the morning and going to school. They're still there in the high school. They're in a, the, your football team or they're in a basketball team and they're just trying to be whatever is considered um, normal for them. So it's a lot of pressure and the systems are so big. When I say systems, I'm talking about um, when we uh, work with young people who are in the Department of Mental Health or um, Department of DCF or Department of DC, uh, DDS, that's it's big systems. And so when a young person needs supportive and they need, they don't, they can't figure out how to advocate for themselves. And it's hard. It's hard to come in and say, I am hungry, I'm scared, and I need some, and I need some place to sleep, right? So the vocabulary and language, because developmentally, they don't have that because they've always been in taking care of self-preservation of needing stuff. So it really takes time. It takes effort. We say here at Bridge that that is three to six months that we know of a young person in our programs being serviced before they actually open up to us. So that's three, of, three to six months is, hi, how you doing? Welcome, take a shower, get something to eat, what's going on, and really constantly until they're really open and are able to feel that they can trust. I mean, that's a big part of it too, right, is the low commitment, like having a place to go and do your laundry, right? Like that's what you're offering is having a place to take a shower, you know, having a place to take a nap and not having to necessarily register yourself or classify yourself or label yourself in, in some way that's highly stigmatized. Right. And and a, a big one is shelters. Like young people don't like the word shelter. 
and we use it in the in the back end and for um, grants. But all of our young people and all our programs, we don't call none of our housing shelters. And they've told us, I don't, I don't, I don't want to live in a shelter. So even the language has to be very appropriate of what they're going through, where they right now. Our emergency residence is named by them. It's called emergency residence, short for. And we call it ER, and everyone's like ER, like them, but it's emergency residence. It's they can stay at night. Our welcome center is uh, first come, first serve. It's called the welcome center. They, our young people, name it because they wanted to make sure they don't have that stigma going through. And you do fun stuff too. I mean, you oh. have like. It's, we have to in party oh, yeah we have to we deal with teenagers that's who that's uh, that if we wouldn't have fun we would go crazy here with that tea uh, we uh we're in the lgbtq march so we're planning that like it's coming so our young people are part of that we have um what is it open mic um that we have so i, I did it a couple of years ago i don't think i won but it was fun we have um Talent shows. Oh, my God, our young people have so many talents. Uh, they're part of the youth count. So we have a YAB that works with the state and the state provides funding. So they pay them for hourly so they can help and support and be an advocate for themselves. We, we pay for proms. We pay for dances. Like they are young. They like to go to prom. They like to wear a dress. They like to graduate, too. And mm -hmm. we, we support all those adventures. We do a lot of field trips, Cabinaby Lake, Six Flags. Kimbo Farms, it's all coming up. I'm with all of those all summer ones, so that's why I know it's top of my head. But we have to because they're young people, and if they have to come every day and think about where am I going to be next, we have to celebrate their wins. And they might be small for, for many people, but they're big. They're big wins just coming in and saying, I'm going to counseling, and I'm seeing a therapist. We have a partnership with Mass General Hospital where we have a psychiatrist on hand because our young people didn't want to go see a psychiatrist, but now the psychiatrist is actually the one giving them lunch or giving them the towel for the shower. So when we start talking about it, it's like, oh, it's Dr. So-and-so. So now it's cool to talk to someone, right? So we have to figure out after 54 years of how to get these services and how to really make it appropriate, but also let them enjoy themselves and let them be young adults that they want to oh we just had a concert we went to don't ask me the name because i'm gonna mess it up we went to some <laughs> concert and the yeah that the pictures were awesome and they had a great time it's like some rapper that i can't even dis pronounce some of the lyrics but it's very important they're very great music and we said the people the young people in our er they were grateful and they went and that stuff is important because that gives us an opportunity now to ask and expect more from them and it's good for let them be young people as they are yeah, and just have like normal young people experiences. Yeah. Um, you you mentioned the uh you know pride parade and I think Alice, I wonder if you can speak to this, just the significance. And I, I wonder how much this has also changed in the last in the few years or if this is still really a significant part of it. Um, we had asked some of the um the guests here who are joining us for this panel for questions ahead of time. And someone had just kind of asked about demographics racially and um you know, looking at the LGBTQ population, historically, it's always been that there's a really significant uh, portion of people who are experiencing youth homelessness who are within the LGBTQ population or trans or have been kind of kicked out of their homes and don't have a place to go. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of, you know, the bigger demographics of, of this within this population? Yeah, and, and I'll start with with LGBTQ youth. We um, our data shows that they are overrepresented uh, among young adults here in Massachusetts in the homelessness systems. And it's interesting because when you look at recent nationwide polls of how many young adults identify as LGBTQ, it's about 27, 28%. Our data is showing about 30 to 35%. It's probably an undercount. Um, again, people, we count who the young people who feel safe. Um, giving information and showing up for services. So we believe it's an undercount. We believe that they are overrepresented, overrepresented in our in our services. Um, but it's about 30, 35 percent statewide. Uh, we know one of the the most um, disproportionate. Um, we know that our our that there's a disproportionate number of BIPOC youth 
um, who enter our system, so black and brown young people. So right now in Massachusetts, about 60% of the young people who are engaged with services across the state are black and brown, um, as opposed to 38% of the most recent Massachusetts census of young adults. So there's an extreme disproportionality of young people accessing our services. I would say the good news is though, is that we do require our programs to also report on demographics of outcomes so that we can make sure that we are serving young people at equitable rates that they're coming in. So they're coming in disproportionate to the general population of young adults. And so we want to make sure that we're at least housing them proportionately. And so the good news is that we are. The bad news is, though, that we need to go upstream because poverty and systemic racism and other and other things are are bringing um, are crushing the housing stability of, of these young people. We know that about a third are coming from foster care, have had foster care experience. About 25% have had juvenile justice involvement. And one statistic that's um, changed recently that we're, we're looking at is after many, many, many years of um, young people really increasing in educational attainment and getting GEDs and high sets and staying in school and graduating with diplomas, that never shifted recently. And so there's been a little incline recently. And so right now, 25% of young people experiencing homelessness uh, do not have a diploma and are not in schools. And so we're working very closely with our partners at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, and DCF to try to figure out how do we offer these young people more support so that family conflict, housing instability, poverty doesn't make them leave school, doesn't make them choose between school because there are services available. But again, they need to know that these services are available and they need to trust that the services are, are trustworthy, but there's some amazing services in the state. Um, but we know that there are young people disproportionately more likely to experience homelessness. And so we're pressing into that data and saying, what can we do? What can we do to support our black and brown young people, our LGBTQ young people, young people coming from foster care? That's a significant number too. I think you said, what was it, 60%? 60%. 60, that's very high. Um, Incredibly high. Elizabeth, yeah, you talked about, um, I think, the trauma, right, of experiencing youth homelessness. And I think homelessness in general is traumatic. And there have been studies and there's a lot of research into how, you know, unsheltered homelessness is very traumatic, how not having that landing place, not having that sense of agency, not really knowing what's next. I mean, every single day. Can you talk about why intervention, why it is so important to get to young people um, and provide resources to them early, you know, to kind of further prevent, as Alice was just saying, like a kind of chronic impounding of that trauma, like a, com a compounding of, of this every single day being outside. I mean, why is intervention, early intervention so important? So the statistical, national statistical data says that 50% of chronic homeless adults um, were homeless as teens. So I ask you, which youth you think should be homeless or which youth not get the services, right? So if we go or if we start younger, then we those that data point looks very different. And it's very important if 50% of chronic homeless adults were homeless as teens right now in our current system, it already we already know that we have to start younger. We already know that we need to provide those system, services for our young people, that they are they are struggling. They're trying to do it on their own. Uh, please don't ask me when I was 15 or 16, I was moving out of my house. Like I I thought I could just move out and want to do it. It's a natural reaction for some. Some don't want to do it. They're sick of rules and everything that happens, right? But when they need those services um, how are they developed for these young people is what we struggle with because they're developmentally changing. What well, Somebody who is at 18 years old is very different at 22 years old. I, at Bridge, we don't believe that an 18-year-old should sleep next to an adult 40-year-old who's homeless. We just don't believe that is the right thing to do. And so your question was how, what, why should we get to them sooner? It's because we already know that the sooner we get to them, the success, the more success rate we have and the more pathways that they can get and, and teaching them. It's all about the, I always say at Bridge with a University of Life Skills for young people here. 
they're constantly, we're constantly learning uh, how to make a bed, how to cook, how to clean, how to say I'm sorry, how to use your words now that, you know, with, with COVID and social media, our heads are down, right? All those things are things that they have to learn at the same time of taking care of themselves. And that has to be, it's different from a 17-year-old. 70% of the young people we see at Bridge, we see over 2,000 young people a year. 70% of the young people we see at Bridge are under the age of 21. 7% are under the age of 17. That's that's pretty, it's a, they're pretty young. These are young young people that um, the trauma can really, if we don't take care of it younger um, and sooner, it will become a long-term effect. And so I we've always, uh, have always said we need to get to young people sooner. We need to have expectations for them sooner. We need to um, have our models and our systems of service to work in tangent with them as they learn and they gauge and they learn more. Once they learn more, they get more. Once they still need to figure out their medication routine, we learn and process, right? Just like, you know, I have two teenagers. I have a, a 19 and a 17 year old. I, it takes me, me, me and my husband, both of us constantly on and we teach my son just literally learn that taking his clothes out of the dryer or out of the washer and putting them in the dryer and drying them, he this smells, his clothes doesn't smell. And I've been saying to this for him for like 10 years, like your clothes smell, buddy. It doesn't smell, mom. Because you wait two or three hours. They have to keep rewashing them and rewashing them. Again, He's able to take his time to learn that because he had a roof of his head and food was not a problem for him. And he was able to learn. But our young people that we see at Bridge do not have the security of food over the head or where their meal is coming from. So they're not bothering to learn all these other things that is part of adulthood. And I know that was a long way of saying that we have to get to them younger because it's our best for society in the long term, our best for taxpayers in the long term. And for them, it's also they're being seen. And that's more important. Well, and I'll tell you something at the state level is that we absolutely <laughs> believe in prevention and all of um, our funded providers through homeless youth services have funding for prevention. They are able to use flex funds, so barrier buster funds to help people who are on on the edge of experiencing homelessness, are, are having housing insecurity, uh, but we want them to do that early intervention, to do that prevention, because as Elizabeth said, it is it is the fewer days of experiencing homelessness, the, the, the less trauma that you're going to experience. And that that's all good. We also know, you know, concurrently, the longer you're experiencing homelessness, not only are you experiencing more trauma, but for many young people, the risk taking behavior goes up because you're in survival mode. And we don't, we don't want that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not their survival game to have to play. We want to connect them to services and to wonderful providers we have across the state. So they don't have to play that game of survival. Mm -hmm. Adolescence and young adulthood is enough survival <laughs> on its own. That's already hard enough to be a teenager. That's right. Alice, you can kind of speak to this because I think the Healy administration has taken a lot of steps to specifically address youth homelessness. Um, and I've seen a lot of steps from state leaders just in the past decade. But I think it, it does often seem or maybe this is just what we see in that in the headlines, but it does often seem that there are more resources for families, right? And then there are a lot of resources. For, there's never enough resources for anyone, first of all, but, you know, families and then individuals, individual adults. Um, and I feel that this population um, sometimes does get overlooked for the reasons that Elizabeth mentioned, which is uh, it's not as visible. Um, and that's because a lot of the people within this population don't want to be visible or don't want to be, in, you know, nobody wants to be known for this, but it's just sort of harder to track down. It's harder to quantify. Um, and because of that, I think sometimes people are forgetting about adolescents who are going through it on their own. Do you, Alice, do you feel like there's, um, I don't know, like, do you feel like there's a part of this population or do you ever feel like this population is kind of falling through the cracks in that in that way? Here's what I'll say. I'm incredibly grateful to the Healy administration for investing $11 million into homeless youth services. And our funding has um, increased almost every year. And so we have $11 million across the state to invest in housing and services and prevention. And could we use more? A absolutely. Part of, part of it is 
we believe in data driven solutions, right? We, we believe in that the data drives the need. And so right now, um, you know, we're always trying to collect better data to say, what is the scope and scale of young people experiencing homelessness in Massachusetts? And how do we build a system to meet that need? Uh, we're actually, here's where I'm going to give a plug where we have are just one week into our statewide youth count. And so it is a, a count that we have done every year uh, for the last, this is the 10th year of it, where we go wide, we go deep, we go broad, and we say, if you are young and experiencing homelessness, we're gonna give you $20 <laughs> to fill out a survey. And we wanna know who you are. We wanna know what you're experiencing. What are your barriers? Who are you? What do you need? Um, what, uh, what has prevented you from getting what you need? And we use that data to say, this is what we need. And the, again, the Healy administration has been wonderful in listening to that data and increasing services and funding. And so I'll be, um, I encourage people to, to, to contact us to get more information on that survey, to find young people who have experienced homelessness or are experiencing homelessness to take that survey because it drives, it drives the need. Um, I, I will say because it is a hidden population, again, we want to encourage young people to to come out for services. And I also don't want to say, um, I want to create services that can that can meet the needs. So again, we, we need that data so that we can build the services and really inform what that need is. Right, I mean, that's the, the whole problem, right? And I think that the even the process with building the surveys and meeting people where they are, and as you said, like just putting in that work to find people and build trust and get them to do it. I mean, that's been something that is you know it's it's been going on for many years now but it isn't something that even existed when i had started reporting on this um there just weren't that many resources specifically for this population um i think bridge was like had 12 beds and it was the only youth shelter in boston um and it just shows the work that both of you have have put in um i think you know you talked about addressing what we need both of you and and kind of figuring out where the needs are and and what needs to be done next what do you think is needed from community members who want to help like how can you know any resident who wants to get involved help or help you know in any in any way on an individual level i think um for bridge a couple of things that uh, can help us. You can check our website, and uh, there's a. We go through food. We have a lot of teenagers here, so we go through food a lot. So definitely um, provide uh, send a meal over or help us um, open or close the the welcome center. That'd be great. So there's a lot of uh, there's a couple of opportunity uh, volunteer opportunities in um, on our website. There's also you know be advocates, you know, November is Homeless Youth Month. Did you know that? Did anybody know it? So it really to touch base on that follow. It's a, we, Bridge has a campaign um, and thanks for help with the state that we've been pushing to talk about um, young people in November and the, the campaign's called um, What I Say, What I Mean. And it's all created by young people. If I say I can't, you know, I get to school early, I'm probably taking a shower at the, the school uh, gym. So it's really getting involved and being advocates with the state and asking what are you doing differently for 18 and 19 year olds? Just ask the questions. What what is this law? What is this policy going to do different for an eighteen and nineteen year old? It's very important um, to be advocates and say our young people deserve something different. And I would add to that, you know, that if if you didn't know that there are young people struggling and experiencing housing instability and homelessness, now you know there are young people who are hidden. Uh, experiencing housing instability and homelessness. And I think the community can educate themselves on where those resources are. And so I will say a, a couple of resources that are just really, really helpful statewide. Um, one is 211. It has resources on on everything from youth shelters to food pantries to fuel assistance. And so you can call. It's a 24-hour hotline in multiple languages, or they also have a web page. So that's an easy-to-remember uh, resource. Homeless Youth Services, so mass.gov, Homeless Youth Services. We also list the services statewide um, of where you can find a provider. And um, I'm also happy to be a resource. I also say it's full of resources, and I'm also happy to, to be a resource to connect people. But be educated. Um, know how to connect people so that Maybe if there's no wrong door, maybe you're a right door to connect young people into services. I will also just say, 
that a lack of affordable housing is a big reason why we still have homelessness in families, in families who are in poverty, families who are doubled up, young people who are struggling to leave shelter into permanent housing. And so for those who may have an extra room or are landlords or are property managers, um, anything that you can do to lower the rent, uh, to make it more affordable, to rent to our young people, to take Section 8 vouchers, uh, to take a chance on our young people. Uh, we need that. We need, we need more landlords partnering um, with programs to, to take our young people. A lot of our providers write letters of support on behalf of our young people, um, and that's wonderful, and I wish more landlords would accept that and house them, because I know it's a housing crisis. Yeah, I want to talk about that as well. I think the there was a uh, Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce report that came out recently that showed that homelessness is rising, housing insecurity is rising, poverty is rising, and you kind of talked about this, you know, mm-hmm. all, how all of these things are are intersecting and how people that were kind of on the brink of potentially losing housing or maybe you lost your job and you're struggling to make rent and they're just you're or you're getting displaced from the city because of how of how the market is changing and there's not enough housing stock how those people are now at a higher risk of homelessness how does the housing crisis and the kind of fever pitch that it's reached now how does it affect this population how does it affect young people um i i'd recently uh, spoken to someone who was his family was kind of disconnected so they're all individually living in different rooms in different apartments now across the city they used to live together in east boston and so that kind of example of like how does it displace and affect young people in this uh, demographic elizabeth if you want to start so that the <laughs> so that's such a loaded question it's not an easy answer tori because um here at Bridge and as the society or Boston and Massachusetts know the price of renting a property is expensive. It's, you know, it's like for I think the average you have to make $124,000 a year just to have a studio or one bedroom in Massachusetts, right? Or in Boston. So just with that stats alone, forget young people or older population or someone with disability or, or so forth, right? Because the the list of people waiting for housing are not just including people who are homeless, but also including people who are working and moving and doing stuff. So I think it's a bigger issue that I can answer in a couple of seconds um, to try to figure out. I know that the state and the city are working tremendously on trying to bring more apartments um, that are low income uh, to to market. That takes a while because you need developers, you need people to build it and so forth. And during that same time, HUD is pushing on making sure we don't um, fund shelters or, or big um, places for people to stay while they wait. So it's this whole like a bottleneck that's happening. What we do, we at Bridge, we have Rapid Rehousing, which is a HUD mandate um, community program that works with the state and the city. And what we provide is young people, we help them with some kind of income for their rent and hopefully they'll they'll have a job that they can provide the rest of it. And what we find is that even the the contract says, you know, for a thousand one hundred that we will be able to provide for rent. Uh, young people can't even meet that because if we pay f- half of it, five or six, they have to find a job, work 40 or 50 hours so they can come up with the other six or $700, right? So it's this circle that we continue to do. Um, we keep advocating and saying, you know, we need different types of housing, not just one type. We need different types of housing, especially for young people, you know, uh, got college dorm settings, they back in college, how we support them to be back in school, because that will be the housing while they're there. Just look at very other different creative ways for our young people. Um, roommate possibilities, because now the rent's um, much more inexpensive or cheaper if you have a roommate situation. So we're looking at different ways to really use those dollars to support the young people moving forward. And and that's a lot of that's a lot of tape going through while you know, the state or the city figures out more more stocks or even more resources. And I, at this point, I don't think if we can throw all the resources into the water, that's going to work, right? Because we're so backed up in how expensive it is that you have to make $124,000 a year. That's including my own staff. 
that are in the same list of young people who are homeless looking for apartments, right? So it's a, it's a big challenge. And we're at the table having conversations all the time and how to make sure that the stay for our young people and our programs at Bridge, um, there's not a limit on stay, right? And there's some funding that stops for six or eight months, but we know it's going to take a young person a year or maybe two years to find its own um, apartment. So we have our welcome center, our emergency residence, but we have our traditional living program that they can live with us for another 18 months. And then we have our Liberty House um, in Dorchester that they can live with us for two or three years. So it provides a stabilization to them while they move um, and develop um, through the ages with them. And so that's important for us that we're able to manage. Yeah. Alice, can you talk a little bit about that, about what resources exist? I think someone had, had asked this in the Q&A ahead of time, but just across the state, I mean, in terms of focusing on permanent housing for this specific population. Sure. Before I get to permanent housing, the trajectory, I think it's helpful to think about the way that we uh, think about like what's our goal at the state with homeless youth services. So with homeless youth, with home with youth services, we say we want to end youth homelessness. Well, what does that mean? We want to make experiences of youth homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. So rare. We're funding prevention. We're, we're saying if you are experiencing housing instability, get help now. <laughs> we want to support you, whether it is family support or rental assistance, education support. We have housing scholarship programs. What can we do to support so that you don't ever have to experience the trauma of homelessness? And then brief. If you do experience homelessness, we want to identify you and connect you quickly so that your experiences of homelessness are not long. Because we know the longer that you're experiencing homelessness, just the more trauma you're amassing um, during that time. And then non-recurring. Once uh, we're able to house young people, whether it is through rapid rehousing or permanent housing, we know that it is not just housing and you're done. Um, we want to offer those supports so that you don't cycle back into homelessness, so that you have the life skills, you have the wages, you have the community support, you have behavioral health support if you need that for mental health or substance use disorders. Um, you have education, again, those things that, so that homelessness is a one-time event so that you have that. For most, the majority of young adults experiencing homelessness, of youth and young adults experiencing homelessness, they will not need a permanent rental subsidy. They may need a few years of it in this housing market. They may need that support to gain those life skills, to, um, to find a place to be supported, to work on their education, and to just stabilize. But the majority are not going to need long-term assistance. So when we talk about permanent supportive housing, this is a, a voucher that, that can last your entire lifetime. It is permanent. And so it is meant, it is a, it is a, a, a type of housing, a voucher system that is designed for people who have experienced chronic homelessness, so several years of homelessness and have a disabling condition. There are some of our young people that are going to fall into that category, but it is a very small number of young people. Again, the vast majority are going to need that support, but are not going to need that permanent housing. There is some of that permanent supportive housing for young people across the state. Um, it is small numbers because that is the current identified need. As needed, young adults can transition into, you know, as they turn 25, 26, um, can transition seamlessly into the adult services for that PSH, permanent supportive housing. But again, those numbers are very small because the vast majority just need a, a long runway of support. Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody else had asked about the shelters and centers that exist. Obviously, Bridge Over Troubled Waters has been doing this for a long time. Um, there's youth on fire in Cambridge. I mean, there are 110, yeah. there are 110, okay. yep, I know the number. There's 110 yeah. shelter beds for youth and young adults, specifically young adult shelter beds across Massachusetts. Um, I would say, again, go to Homeless Youth Services and you can find, if you're a young adult experiencing crisis, here's where to go. And it has the, the list of providers across the state. But there is no city or town in Massachusetts where you cannot get help. Uh, it, it may be a bit of a car ride, but we can offer that car ride. There are partnerships with Lyft. They will give you a free ride to shelter. We don't want transportation to be a barrier, but there are there are shelter options available statewide. And we also really want to plug into prevention because they're, they're getting full. They are full. Um, something that we have been uh, offering to providers across the state is something called a housing problem solving training. Some people have heard the term diversion so that it's 
a young person who is looking for shelter saying, is there anywhere else that we can support for you to go? Because when you're in a crisis, you can't always think about all of the resources you might have. You, you can't think straight. You can't, you say, ah, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing. So it's, we've been training people to patiently sit with young people and do resource mapping. Um, do you have other family? Are there other friends? Are there folks you can stay with? Is it a financial barrier? Are there financial resources that we might be able to offer to offer to get you a place to stay? Because um, there, there is, the inflow is, is increasing. And so we need to be able to stabilize young people. Again, can you go anywhere else? Is there a network? Is there a community of people so we can stabilize you instead of going into shelter? Because shelter, even a young adult shelter, it's not ideal. It's not ideal. When you say that the, the inflow is increasing or there's an influx now or there's more people coming and seeking help, you know, within the context of how difficult it is to access the numbers that we had just talked about, um, do you think it's possible that outreach is getting better and that people are coming forward and asking for more? I mean, obviously, it's it's just one of those confounding things with the data, right? Because on one hand, I mean, somebody had asked in the, in the Q&A beforehand, how long has teen housing, like young adult, you know, youth homelessness been so bad? And I think we have to sort of square that in the context of knowing that we have only kind of within the last 10 years really started to, I mean, the, what you're describing as a process is, is incredibly like stringent and, and, you know, you're putting so much work into finding folks and building up that trust and prevention and then transitioning people into other things as well and finding the, oh, and the ability to, you know, get those resources. You mentioned that there are providers across the state, but it's also based a lot off of the data that exists and you know that there's more. Um, so I wonder if it's frustrating to be faced with this, um, if it does genuinely feel like the crisis of this is worsening or if there's a part of it and maybe it's all of these things or none of them, but if there's a part of it that also is just about how more people are coming forward now and seeking resources. And maybe there's no way to know that, but I, I guess that's just what I'm, I'm trying to provide that context for all of this. Yeah. And Elizabeth, I'd love your, your take on it too, but you know, I, I'll say that, um, you know, my roots were actually in street outreach. So, you know, I, I, I think that's my retirement plan as well someday. Um, assuming we're so not going to retire, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I, I say this because I, all of these numbers represent young people, right? Like I, I talk about data points, I talk about disproportionality, but all of these represent young people. And so it, it has always been a problem. Anytime somebody is sleeping outside when they don't want to be, that is a problem. Whether there is one person or 5,000 young people, it has been a problem for a very long time. And so do we have a better grasp on data? Yes, we do. Um, when we did launch an awareness campaign, we did a statewide awareness and connection campaign two years ago, our numbers increased. And we said, did our numbers increase because people knew where to go? Probably. Did our numbers increase because of the economy? Probably. It, it, it's hard to know. Um, it's hard to know. We have scaled up services. We have built housing for young adults. We have added more shelter beds. And what we would like to do again is keep digging into prevention because we know that we need to scale up housing we know that we need to scale up these services but if we you know the analogy of there's all these babies in the river and you can keep pulling them out of the river but if somebody doesn't say why are all these babies in the river in the first place and go back there you're never going to solve it and it's always it's going to keep increasing and again even one young person is one young person too many experiencing homelessness right i we talked about that analogy. I think I was referencing I Ayala Livni, who used to run Youth on Fire, had mentioned that to me because she was, I think this is fair to say, frustrated at the time. I mean, this is 10 years ago and, and feeling like, OK, there's babies drowning in the river. You, run, you can run up to the top of the river and try to find the source. You can, you know, stand on the side and pull people out or you can go in and try to teach people how to swim. And the work that you both do you know, on a day to day basis is is all of those things at once. Um, and I love that you mentioned that these are individual people, because I think in general at large, right, we we sometimes hear about the trends and, of course, COVID and poverty and the housing crisis have affected people experiencing homelessness. Um, but this specific population is so unique in its needs and 
has historically just not been counted. And that's just been, I think, probably, I mean, you've, you've said it's one of the biggest challenges. Um, I wonder if, you know, you feel any hope at all about, and, and Elizabeth, you can maybe talk about, you've been doing this and, and Bridge Over Troubled Waters has been doing this for a long time um, in terms of seeing people that you've helped and people that have come to you and kind of changed our lives to know that it's okay to ask for help. Um, cause in these situations, I think, you know, you've got your pride and you've got your dignity and yeah. your agency and you want to protect yourself and that's honorable. Um, and asking for help can feel really, really hard for a lot of people. Yeah. I think the agency being around over 54 years, right. And, seeing a lot of young people coming through. And yes, the last 10 years, there's been a lot of focus for the state to really count and see what this, what it means. It is continuously very frustrating to have only one young person out on the street. I agree with Alice. These are individuals. I see this is our future generation. This is our lawyers, our doctors, our social workers, our teachers. 18, 19, they still have their whole life ahead of them their whole life ahead of them. And so replanting the seed and re and, and rewatering it to give them the opportunity and chance, it's always very rewarding. So I, I bridge this many stories. I, I've been here as a CEO for over 10 years now. But before that, I used to be a, um, a clinician here. I used to, I worked on um, street outreach right after college and I ran the medical van. Then I came in-house to do counseling. And the biggest rewarding is sometimes, you know, we think everything happens overnight, microwave, you put it in and it happens, right? But with young people, it's, you see them at 18, and you hope to get them out of here before they're 19, 20, or 21, then you don't see them again. And then you see them and they're 30, 40, or they're married, or they're a social worker, or they're a nurse. And it's like, oh, my God. And they bring it back to just the connection that they had. And I can say many stories um, of just the smiles. We a, a young man, and I'll say his story, his stories in our podcast, on our website. So he said it's okay to say it. He started with us. He was like 17 years old. He was with in DCF custody. We worked with DCF while he lived with us. Then he turned 18. Then he was our young man. And he got himself into Bunker Hill. And then he got himself into BU. And then while he was at BU, he lived here in our welcome center, then in our transitional living program, in our basic center um, for runaway homeless youth. And so he was he's, he was here. And he, I asked him, I said, well, you know, what did you like and what what you thought about the rules? Because we have all these rules here, but nobody likes them. And he's like, you know, I hated them then, but I actually liked, I understand why now because it kept me in track. And I was like, oh, okay, good. So then I always use that. Every time somebody says, oh, I have to make my bed. I'm like, hey, you know, I like it now. You'll like it later 20 years from now. <laughs> so it's really seeing that change of when you continuously stay on with someone Bruce's story, he went, he got himself into college in the first semester. He His grades were coming down. And I said, what's going on, Bruce? What's happening? He's like, I'm working 40 or 60 hours because I have to come up with four or $5,000 a semester for me to stay in school. And I was like, what? If I raise that, if I provide that, would you give me an A? I'll tell him now because he's much older now. I, oh, my God. I think Bruce is 27. I feel so old, 27, 28. But if you would have brought me a C, I was going to still pay for it. But he didn't know that. So I said, you have to bring me an A. And we fundraised the best $24,000 that I've ever raised in my life. That young man graduated from BU during COVID. I was mad that I didn't get to scream at the uh, at graduation. And he was here during COVID in a year to just walking around. And I remember walking by him and I said, Bruce, what are you doing? What's going on next? He's like, I'm just going to wait around and see what happens. And I'll see. He came back to live in our Liberty House. And I walked away nervous. I said, oh, my God, he's going to be a statistics. He he needs to do something next. And I was like, no, he's a normal 21-year-old. That's what 21-year-olds need to do. They need to go back home and be feel safe. They need to think about what's the next plan in their life and feel okay. And that that reward doesn't happen overnight. That takes time. That takes consistency. That stays on top of him. Keep doing it. He got himself into Northeastern University. He's a grad student. He's on his third year or fourth year. He makes the permanent supportive housing. Does He don't need that. His job, he makes more money than us, most of my staff here. He works in a corporate world where he has a basketball outside and they have pizza on Friday nights and, uh, and burgers and he's done all this great IT stuff. That is the life he wanted, couldn't, dreamed it, but didn't know how to get there. Our job was to get him over that bridge. 
all those services to get there and push them there. That's why, that's why I smile and keep doing it. It's not easy. <laughs> Anyone who has teenagers know uh, raising uh, young people, it's hard. And, and I have 2,000 young people. I have 250 living with me on a single night scattered in different of our programs. It's a lot. They're not easy. But their their path, once you stay maintained and give them the opportunity, is pretty amazing. So I could keep going on stories and t- stories about what is important. Actually, that's him and his graduation. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's him and his wow. graduation. When he did it, when we opened back up, and uh, he gave me that for my birthday. So having that connection is important because that's attachment and family, that's support moving forward. And that's not giving up no matter what, because we wouldn't give up on our own, right? So why would we give up on anyone that comes to our doors? It's it's not a question that we ask here. We have to figure out and put the resources together. And if the resources are not there easy to find, then we have to, we have to, pin it through and make sure that young person has that path. So it's really important. And that's what keeps me going. I'm excited that people are talking about it. I'm excited that we have Homeless Youth Month, that people are aware that it's there. That's exciting because now we can move policies and procedures much faster, that it's real, that, you know, it's not just bridge seeing it. This is real. This is a national problem. This is a state concern. And so it's important. And I'm glad that we're talking about it, that we have a name for it, that we have a Homeless Youth Commission with the state. I was just appointed to it today. So that's exciting because now we can push that. We can push and look at the systems that we have in place and make them work better, right? And how do we make sure that this population does not get unseen and that they're not hitting anymore? And Tori, I also just want to add that last year, over a thousand young people, their housing was retained or they were rehoused across the state. And so a thousand young people are no longer experiencing homelessness or housing instability across the state. Um, that's a success. We have a college housing scholarship program throughout the state yeah. where we celebrate graduations from college every year. And we celebrate, we believe in celebrating. Um, in you know, state government, you have quarterly reports. In our quarterly reports, our providers send us success stories every quarter. And it is wonderful to read about the young people who are getting jobs and moving into apartments, um, regaining custody of their children, graduating from college, it, it's, there, there is hope. I think if there wasn't hope, you wouldn't stay in this work, mm-hmm. um, but there is hope and we need to do more. Mm-hmm. So that's what I wanted to ask you, if it, what, what brings you hope in this? And so it's so, that's an amazing aspect of that, with it, that within the report, they send you success stories. Are they success stories about actual like individual people about like, is it like a Christmas letter? Like, <laughs> Doing. It's a Christmas letter that uses sort of de-identified initials. JS. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, well, because, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Elizabeth. So, well, here at Bridge, we see success in different ways. You know, Bruce was, uh, you know, one extreme, but just coming in and looking at you in the face and saying hi and learning the language. Because, you know, young people, there's a whole language, you know, like sus, like the, that's my new word, or pause. Pause is my new word. Like when you say something that's not cool, you say pause. So it's a, that, that gives me hope of learning and being part of the future that they, they're so resilient, right? And there's many stories, just, just finishing their counseling or just going to counseling, taking their medication, or even saving their money, right? All these little small wins are big wins. And I, we have many and that keeps me going. I, I, what my new thing, what I like right now that I'm all in the mix is the whole language. I think I'm cool when I use the right word. Um, I feel useful or they look at me when I say it the wrong way. They're like, yeah, you messed it up. Don't, don't say that again. I was like, what? So that, for me, when it keeps me hopeful and, and just the connection is that, but it, I'm, I'm also hopeful that they're young. And if we expect the most and hold them to the expectations, they will break those glasses every time. And they have. And so I continue to push to do different. So I know Alice has seen me many times. We need to do different. We just can't do the same thing. Mm-hmm, that sounds like a little the same, but no, let's do it different. It's important because every young per- person, as Alice said, and we've mentioned, they're individuals. So they can't go the same path as somebody else. So we have to be nimble enough to move. And Bridge is able to provide that. Like, oh, this young person needs this, but this one doesn't. And that's okay to be mm-hmm. able to do that. I call it the rib rescue. We need to rib Right. Rescue. Not everybody wants to right. go it, to college and not that's everybody right. wants that's right. to learn that's a trade right. and not everybody wants to go, you know, and as that's you mentioned, right. a 21 year old who wants to take time off, I mean, that is a normal thing. And so yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I think, you know, people who work with adolescents and young people in general, and I think, you know, like a lot of teachers understand this, but teenagers as a population are inherently kind of misunderstood, right? I think there's sort of a cultural people just sometimes see groups of teenagers as a threat. And it's just like a straight, like people, even people, everyone has been a teenager and yet this persists. Um, but what do you think? I mean, you know, in my conversations with people who are young and are experiencing homelessness and really people of all ages who are experiencing homelessness is just, there's a lot of misunderstandings that people find really frustrating. Um, and mm-hmm. people feel really misunderstood. And I think particularly when you are a young person and you are experiencing homelessness, it's like a double layer of mm-hmm misunderstanding. Well, and I think to that, and I think something that's incredibly important, we actually require that all of our uh, regions funded through Homeless Youth Services have youth action boards. So have groups of young people who are experiencing or have experienced homelessness who are informing programs and policy saying, this is what we experienced. And it's always a diverse group. One size does not fit all for them. And so they're saying, this is what works. This is what you should tweak. This is what you should consider. We also have a really great group of our, it's a shout out to our YAC, our Youth Advisory Council, which advises the state. And they set their goal as saying they aim to educate, inspire, inform the Commission on Unaccompanied Homeless Youth so they can eradicate youth homelessness. And they said, look, part of it is, you know, educate. Here's our experiences. We want to tell you who we were and what worked for us. We want to inspire. You guys are old and dusty. So we're going to give you some fresh ideas, right? Um, that are going to work and inform. We're going to then do some feedback like, oh, you didn't quite get it right, but you're, you know, you're close so that we can actually do something about it. That nothing about us without us. We know that one size doesn't fit all and young people are the core of the solution to ending youth homelessness. And we right. believe that we invest in it Agreed. It's essential. And it's like simple stuff. You might think, oh, big policy. It's like you make an appointment with a young person is at one o'clock and they showed up at one twenty. The appointment got canceled. Like, yeah, you can't do that with young people. So it's like you make an appointment just for your own calendar, but they're going to show up at one thirty, and you're going to see them. So at Bridge, you're going to see them. It's important. Or you... um said to a young person you were going to give them a jacket and they show up and the jacket was not there or they're swearing and that's their way of expressing their pain they're swearing up and down we don't terminate young people in our programs for swearing (laughs) actually it's part of the language so if we i let everybody that gets hired here if you don't like young people or teenagers or you don't like to hear a couple of swears this is probably not the place for you because it's just a form of communication it doesn't mean they're mad at you they're just going through that later just calm down and talk to them so it's different little harm reduction ways that we can have a conversation with a young person, make them feel welcome, that in the mainstream doesn't work. It doesn't work if you go to the RMV and you have to wait there for two hours. That doesn't work for a young person, right? So we have to train them and teach them and what, else, what other ways to do and, and support them in that way. We don't do, I mentioned appointments, but in clothing or if you offer something, make sure you go through with it. It's important that you're not part of the same um, of like, we're going to promise you something and don't deliver so we don't do promises here at bridge unless we know we can deliver those promises and that those little things are important for them and if we don't know the answer we are very encouraged to say i don't know that answer let's figure it out together or i don't know if that can happen let's figure it out together because we don't run that or we don't we don't manage that or we don't own the landlord that's not our property and so really having those real conversations or saying i'm sorry i messed up I gave you the wrong information. And I think sometimes as adults, we have a hard time just saying, we gave you the wrong answer, or I'm sorry, or I didn't mean to hurt you. And that's really important because they've been hurt many times, right? And so you have to just- Yeah, and you want to be a source of stability for them, but it sounds like they're teaching you a lot as well. Yes, um, I want to thank I want to thank Elizanji, who is our uh, intern who put this together, speaking of young people who are getting it done. Mm-hmm. Um, and thank you both so much for this. Um, you know, I think that this will be posted online so people can kind of continue the conversation in the comments. And um, yeah, anybody who wants to get involved, there's been a lot of resources posted or just get in, involved and reach out to our guests, um, Dr. Alice Colgrove and Elizabeth Jackson. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for your time. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Mm-hmm.